What's up, family? This is your man, not your boy. Go black to Africa. Peace and blessings to each and every one of you all as y'all come in. I am ecstatic because I have a guest that many of us are familiar with, and maybe you might be too young enough to even know, but I'm quite sure if, if you listen to your mama and daddy's uh, CDs, I guess we can't say cassette tapes because that's years ago, but you had to have had come across what this brother's work have done over the years. A prolific brother who have changed my mindset back in the days of the 80s. But without further ado, I want to get into just a little introduction of him because, you know, this brother here, you know, he remind me of when I was coming through the 70s, Marvin Gaye, you know, what's going on, you know, who's bringing out what's going on in the streets and society, whether it was James Brown, I'm black and proud, pushing man and, and motivating and encourage people, whether it was Gil Scott Heron, you know, who, you know, did an awesome opportunity, a, a job with his music and speaking, man, those things like, you know, the revolution uh, will not be televised or uh, so many, so many artists I can just bring out that w came through uh, 50s, 60s, 70s. But my brother, Chuck D, public enemy number one, he came out in the 80s using his platform uh, to bring out those issues of life that was in damn Erica. That's right, put the D in front of America, capitalized the E, damn Erica. Brought up in New York City where the Statue of Liberty is. And he went on through his time and found himself on radio after, after you know, went through college, a very brilliant man, smart with wisdom, and found himself behind the mic or even on the wheels of steel DJing. But I like to look at this brother's work at, that he has established and he had created. It's in a time capsule I believe everybody should open up. You know, going down memory lane, let me say this right here. You know, um, he's known as a revolutionist or a revolutionist, a Pan-African-American activist, a rapper, a lyricist. Some consider his music to be controversial, political, politically provoking, even called anti-Semitic. He received multitude of accolades and awards, accomplished 15 albums as public enemy, has contributed through his uh, radio station that he currently has for the last 15 years. And you don't stop to over, contributing to over 100,000 artists and over 500,000 songs. And he has docu a documentary series, Fight the Power, How Hip Hop Changed the World. You know, I could go on and on um, what this brother has accomplished, but yet I'm gonna leave it up to him to come in right now, ladies and gentlemen, but brace yourself because well, who we have here today is the man, the myth, the legend, Chuck D, public enemy, number one. Brother Chuck D, what's happening, my man? My brother, my man, not your boy. You know, go black <laughs> to Africa. You know, I mean, I've been checking you out. And like I said, you're my world GPS. I'm proud to say I'm your brother and a fanatic, a fan of of your work and what you do. And seriously, the, the heartbeat of myself, considering myself an earthison and not a, a citizen of any nationality or any government or any country, I believe the earth is ours and you are the GPS and, and the pulse rate and the heartbeat of it. Yes, it comes through these apparatuses, these gadgets, you know, that, that we have to figure out sometimes how to make, you know, peace with sometimes, but understand how to grapple with and understand that sometimes they, they could be platform plantations, but what you do with it is the right thing, brother. And I am very honored to be here and, um, and to be part of Go Black to Africa. So thank you. And I, and I, and I reached out to you. I, every time I would see you, I yeah. like, I got to I got to get on this brother's show. I got to get on, on 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 the show because seriously when when you talk to the people about all these places a lot of them might not understand the jewels that you are dropping to be able to break the chains of wherever they're at. 
Mm -hmm. And I don't mean the, the 2000 by 3000 hot box of the US of A or damn America, as you say, because I call mm -hmm. them US players. I don't even give them a, you know, people from the United States have the audacity to call themselves Americans. I'm like, well, you only a piece of that. Mm -hmm. So widen that and break the chains at least. And what you do is you, you, you eradicate those chains by saying this whole world should be ours to be able to be at instead of limited into a box so they could play three card money with us. So thank you. Nah, brother, I appreciate, man, the kind words, man, and it means a lot. And, and you know, when you wrote, reached out to me, you know, you sent me the email and threw me for a loop because you all, you know, he said, you know, it was very short too, very short, simple. He said, I travel all, he said, I travel all over the world in parts of Africa, but seriously, you're the best thing ever for our people. Chuck yeah. D, public enemy. And so when I saw it, I was like, I sent the message back and I said, surely this isn't the Chuck D. And you hit me back with a video and you say, yeah, my brother, go back to Africa. Go you know? back to Africa. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm your, I'm your man. That's your boy. Yeah. And man, I, I, I tell you, Chuck, uh, it meant a lot to me because even you uh, and what you have done and accomplished, I'm quite sure you've had those those days that you feel like your message ain't getting across to people. You feel like, why should you go on? And you hit me at a, a right time because, you know, sometimes we 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 wear out, we get tired. And, um, you know, each time I get to that place, somebody comes to me and say, brother, hey, they've seen me somewhere. And like, man, keep doing what you're doing. And I know it's because the most time, man, put it on your heart at this specific time to let me know as a confirmation, I am on the right track and continue doing what I'm doing. So you you definitely, man, hit me in that aspect. So I thank you because number one, the time you've given me, because I know you are busy, man. <laughs> you know, and I, and and giving that we're, time, we're, man. We're, we're, we're all busy. Our lungs move, so we move along yeah. with it, right? The pulse moves with a beat. We move along yeah. with that beat, man. Everybody's busy, busy, and that's what we want to do in our life. But to find time and to share time with each other, with like-minded forwardness, is the thing that is not just an obligation, but it should replenish you and give you joy. It gives me joy to be able to share this moment with you, you know, because right. everything from the outside looking in has always been forward movement. What can I add? to the things that I gained from you. And I'm glad we share this moment. Let's let's make it happen, baby. Appreciate it, brother, appreciate it. Man, you know, I've, I've mentioned earlier already that, you know, your music is a time capsule. And I hope that everybody can go back in time and, 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 and revisit, man, what you started and created. And, you know, my first question to you, because um, coming through the 80s, man, it was it was a lot going on. It was a lot going on. And to see what you birthed and brought out of, of you through your experience and what you saw, your perception of what the world was like or America or what have you, share with us with a little bit, man, because you came in and, and shocked the world with, you know, yo bum rush the show. Mm -hmm. Share with us, man, those influencers and what motivated you, man, to turn your platform uh, to be a voice for the people. Well, I was fortunate to um, give thanks to being born at the right place and the right time. Um, I'm born from two Harlemites, born in Harlem Hospital. My mother, my father, mother in eight, uh, 38, father, uh, father in 38, mother in 39. Um, grandparents for the Carolinas migrated, which makes you understand immediately when you start asking questions what the black migration meant in the first part. Mm -hmm the last century, very aware, allowed to be independent minded, but I had young hip parents in the 60s, a period where I had Negro on my birth certificate. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> ask questions like, why, why are we colored? I'm six years old. Why are we colored all of a sudden instead of Negro, which is kind of hard to say. And then by the end of that decade, 1969, I'm nine years in going into 1970, Black is beautiful and were part of the Black Panther lunch pro, uh, program when I visited my grandparents in Harlem. My other grandparents moved out to Queens. By the end of the decade, we moved further out to the next county, Long Island. 
once again, a study of black migration, but your ties are still in the areas where your parents were brought up along with your cousins and relatives like that. So you're getting a teaching moment every, every inch of the way. Then things to read being in New York, being this the melting pot, also the melting pot that will melt you if you don't aware, if you're not aware who you are to connect with your collective. So yeah. my parents are always aware of community, where we was at and how we carried ourselves. So all the things that were around us to understand who we were in the middle of everything else in the world. I always thought when I was growing up, I had an advantage, bro. Cause I knew about everything else, but I knew the world, uh, well, the, the world around me, which was mm -hmm. at the time, the United States, they didn't know enough about me. Like I knew about them. So I always thought I was at the advantage. I was like, man, mm -hmm. it's like in, in, in ball, I'm making a move. They don't know what's coming at them. So I got the first 10 years of my life absorbing this, going from Negro to colored to all of a sudden being black and it's beautiful in a 10 year period. Those are form formation stages. And then at the same same time, seeing hearing about assassinations, uh, mm. uh, Malcolm X when I was five, you know, um, the Dr. Martin Luther King when I was eight. I had to stay home from school on that one because the mm. city got all paranoid. Um, Fred Hampton and Black Panther Party, we was in the Panther Lunch Program. All of a sudden, they get murdered. And then Angela Davis and Huey Ewe, Newton are going to jail. Wow, they were mm -hmm. the leaders of the organization. We used to say, free Huey. So all these things lined up. And then we happened to move to Roosevelt, Long Island, which was a square town on Long Island, Nassau County, mm -hmm. which everybody migrated from all the different boroughs in the area. And what, what white families did is that once they knew black families were coming in, then they had what they call white flight. And that was one of the first white 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 test areas of the entire nation. After, of course, mm -hmm. what happened in Brooklyn and Queens. That, they call that blockbuster. But mm -hmm. when houses, they called it white flight. And in this one square mile town, when my family moved there in 1969, it was 50% black, 50% white. By 1972, it was 90% black and 10 percent <laughs> white and then and, yeah. and, and you want to talk about a town number one yeah you was all black but then there was rivalries like where are you from well we from the bronx yeah but we live here now and, and we from brooklyn so you had in this square mile you had all this synergy and energy i mean in my fourth grade class i had richard griffin professor griff also hank shockley he was two grades ahead and keith shockley a grade behind i lived down the block from eddie murphy Dr. J used to dribble the ball in his last years of high school on his way to playing pro basketball. So in this in this con concentration, one square mile came a whole bunch of brilliance, accessibility, and also competition. We went to a program at, at 10, 11 years old that for some reason they told us uh, kids, our parents signed us up for a program at Hofstra University, and it was called the Afro American Experience. And with mm. nine and eleven, it was like a summer camp, but was run by um, people from the Nation of Islam at that time. Um, college students who had that revolutionary slant at that time, mm. uh, and Africanists. And they realized for all these black kids moving into this place, they need to go to some different type of thing. And the young people and the students at that time made sure that this university camp happened on Hofstra University. And we went there in 1970. The thing about it, bro, when we came out of that camp, we were going back in the fourth and fifth grade challenging teachers in the fourth and fifth grade their their um their curriculum no nah, columbus mm. if he did discover and they were like yo what is this and this was going around viral with us at 10 and 11 years old to challenge the bs that was coming through the curriculums at fourth mm. and fifth grade this, there was no other place we felt in the whole country that was on top i mean we reading and back in those days jet magazine wasn't just about the the the, the records and the centerfold they had thick commentary now mm -hmm. it might not be all the way to the, to the radical side but it was thorough journalism and it was also mm -hmm. 
speaking on places that was happening other than the United States. That, that was the level of journalism at the time. So here we are 10, 11 years old, nine years old, eight years old, you know, singing African songs, singing chants, you know what I'm saying? And having political study at eight, nine, 10 years old. And even yeah. to the point, like, like it, you know, it, what happened is that for some reason in 1972, they disbanded it. Wow. Because wow. those one, two, those one, two, those two years, 1970 and 1971, and, and, and most of the public enemy, older, you know, uh, brothers, myself, Griff, Hank, uh, Flavor, we were part of the Afro-American experience. Mm. So what we had gotten back then at 9, 10, 11 years old just stuck with us. Right yeah. throughout, even at, um, as, as times changed and more people came into the community, they missed that 1970, 1971 period where we were learning about Africa and things like that, when the schools were no way in hell the schools going to teach that. Maybe ninth, ninth grade, they're going to teach you, okay, imperialism and, and, you know, okay, the Congo is by Belgium and stuff like that, and then leave it at that on how, yeah. you, know, you know, how that works, right? So mm -hmm. we were well-equipped, way ahead of the game. They planted that seed. We ran with it. They disbanded it. Wow. That's the core. Amazing. That's the core of the public enemy seed ideal of the world is ours as opposed mm. to okay i'm born in in queens and my parents from harlem and that's the end of our world once yeah. that world was told that it, that it was a world that we were at that world was open like this bro even if we never visited the world was open so mm. i throughout my whole life have never looked at being sedentary in one spot ever. And the minute mm. that, you know, things lined up later on, I never knew that I would travel the world as much. I didn't, uh, my mom's raised me to be a conscientious objector. So I damn sure wasn't journaling no military, no matter what. <laughs> but I said, for well, some reason, my calling is to see the earth and never be an alien stuck and chained in one spot. And, and, and the music thing happened to collide. And that's a whole nother story. But whatever questions you want to ask about that, how that started. So we in this one square mile town and then what boils out of that? What grows up at the same time? Of course, culture is our everything, man. Right? The difference is, is that I grew up in a Motown, Stax, Atlantic, Jazz, James Brown, Rita Franklin, household, Curtis Mayfield, when they was also singing the same songs that we was rocking to at eight, nine, ten, yo, we're a winner, you know, mm -hmm. truth and power songs. When we in the yeah. sweet spot of seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. I'm 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 eight years old, man. That's James Brown. Yeah. We yeah. we we were colored yesterday. We black because of cause James Brown singing the song. So we are we are shaped by culture, molded by family, and and rooted in the fact that black was an advantage. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Black was an Man. advantage, was an advantage. Yeah. And you know, it was yeah. things, it was mysteries. Like, like, you know, there was a lot of like, you know, when Dr. King was assassinated, there was anger in the air, man. There was confusion. There, you know, it, this period right about now feels like the same atmosphere of the United States as 1968, where there was just this, that, and everything, you know, like a, a lot mm -hmm. of asking questions and and trying to figure out how do you rebound after, you know, after what you saw as being that focal point just eliminated, like, yeah, nigga, what? And then that happens. Yeah. It's like, wow. So it was it was tension. But growing up 9, 10, 11, and 12 years old, we was the seeds that understood that our battle was to find like-minded collective people that thought like us around the world. If we didn't find it, we wasn't going to fight it. Maybe keep it inside, but it never went away, bro. Never went away. You know, you touched on something there when you talked about, man, the, uh, you see y'all are part of the program of the Afro. Afro-American um, experience. Hofstra University, experience. 1970 and 1971. Yeah. And you know, it, it takes me back, man, when you, you all, Y'all hit the scene. 
And that second album that y'all came out, you know, it take a nation of millions to, to hold mm -hmm. us back, right? When that album hit, man, I was in the military, you know, you yeah. know, because my dad was in the military. My dad did 22 years in the Air Force. Yeah. So like yeah. any young man typically is going to follow the footsteps. My dad was a U.S. Marine. My dad was a Marine. Oh, was he? Yeah. My, so, my, my yeah. dad was, he was Superman for real. And my mom's Superman. Yeah. I can't explain, I can't explain the, the, their unbelievable brilliance. I can't explain that. Yeah. And when y'all hit the scene, man, it was almost the same effect of you bringing that knowledge. Because, man, the 80s kind of went dormant and quiet. Mm -hmm. You had R a lot of things going on. Bro. It was a decade of R&B. The decade of R&B. Reagan yeah, and yeah. Bush. Yeah, yeah, the Reaganomics. Disco came out. Pop came in. R&B. Mm -hmm. uh, all that stuff. You know, yeah. But um, when that album hit, man, I'm going to tell you. It hit in a different way for us, brother, especially in the military. And I'm going to speak on that because that album dropped in 88. Yes, sir. And um, the, the, interesting, thing about, the, the interesting thing about it, because it was a black. Yeah. And, you know, the interesting thing, Chuck, was I was in correctional custody, man, in the Air Force. I, they, they, they locked me down for 30 days because I got in some trouble. Mm -hmm. And... Out of all the 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 the, the uh, songs on that album, all of them, man, was hitting. The one that hit me the most that started out, I mean, you know, on that album, I mean, it was it was Bring the Noise. I mean, you know, we had, you know, Don't Believe the Hype. We had Louder Than the Bomb. But one that hit me was Black Still in the Hour of Chaos, mm. you know. You had, you know, uh, a party for a uh, party for your right to fight. But mm -hmm. that black still, when it hit, man, you know, it goes back to what you were saying of being educated in who you are, because a lot of us who was in the in the military and I was I, at that time I was stationed in South South Carolina. A lot of us brothers, man, but I knew brothers from New York City, from Cali, mm -hmm. from small country towns all over, man. And right. when that hit, man, we took that that song as though we were in prison in the military. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We were, we actually, we're actually, cause like how you said, when y'all went back to school and, mm -hmm. and, and challenged the teachers, man, that album, we were challenging our officers, these white people. Mm -hmm. We, we had a voice now, man, that was like, yo, there's some injustices going on, man. Brothers, man, we being mistreated. And, and, and that album, man, opened us up. And they knew they were in trouble because they had to address a lot of things that was that remained quiet for so long, yes, you know, sir. because in the 70s and 80s, man. And when black people started getting into the middle class, everybody kind of got a little comfortable and quiet. Nobody wanted to ripple the water. Nobody wanted to really sacrifice, man, and say, yo, what's going on is wrong. You know, because in the military, we were getting passed over for promotions. We weren't put in positions. We were, you know, we were being they was putting brothers out, man. You know, you make one mistake and they want to put you out. So when that right. came and I was locked up I, and that gravitated towards me, man, it shook the military. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what to do with us. And so yeah. what I would like to do, man, is, is kind of find out from you, man, in your world and your perception and your view at that time when that album dropped, you know, because I like the title, man, this interview, what's going on? What was yes, going on, man? Because when that album hit, man, it just blew open everything. Yes, you yes, know? sir. It was a culmination because you know I'm a teenager, and in the in the seventies, and I saw that period. You know, we went through the whole disco thing. We saw the evolution of hip hop come out of it. Long Island, we was able to get an echo of all those things that was happening in the city. But I mean, if it's in the city. You know, one day it's a train ride away, and then the next day, yeah. you know, what I'm saying uh, even even before that, so we understood how the music had the message. I mean, I grew up Motown house, but in the seventies, I I was a person out of my clique that loved what Leon Huff and 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 um, Kenny Gamble were doing with Philadelphia International, and they had message mm -hmm. music, and they had the OJs. And they had Teddy Pendergrass talk about bad luck. 
and they talk, mm -hmm. talked about OJ's message in the music, Love Train. Everything that Gamble and Huff put out was mm -hmm. basically saying any music we put out as black people, regardless what anybody say, it's love music. Now, it might sound hard, it might come at you, it might be whatever, but it's like, I love you. I got your back, and this is connected with us. That's why yeah. coming from the city of the then brotherly love, Philadelphia, Philadelphia International meant a lot. That was also the beginning of records that, that started to be like disco records, MFSB, you know, Love is the Message. Cats used to rap on top of that, you know what I'm saying? And also rapping on top of it, it was like, yeah, you're in a party, you're going to make sure the party go on and on to the break of dawn. And we had a, a solid collectiveness amongst us as a people with this music, 75, 76, 77. But then COINTELPRO, there's cracks in the armor. And the cracks in the armor, we come from a square town where in 1974, I don't smoke, but you know, the people around you that kind of do, and they, you know, if they work and they want to come home and you know, get their, their brew or their, their weed and chill out, right? They took it off the streets. All of a sudden, mm. by 76, 77, there's like it's off the, the streets, and they and now the same guys going around saying, Well, here's cocaine. And first, there was a rejection to cocaine because people align that with okay, super fly. Also, I remember going to the Bronx and seeing uncles shooting up in their arm. I saw how the United States dealt with Vietnam vets and, and mm -hmm. really having no job and having to go to methadone clinics. So mm -hmm. the Vietnam vets got effed over completely. And we saw this as a 13, 14, 15 year old. So we see yeah. the community of older brothers that we looked up to. Black Steel comes out. 19 as a 1967 idea when I saw my two well, I saw my one uncle get drafted to go to fight in Southeast Asia in Vietnam the day he got out of high school. Mm. He just got to get out of high school in Queens. I'm seven years old. He happy on the last day gets a knock on his door. So and so John Robinson. And he says, Yeah, he goes to the door. Dude comes up fully like marined out. Gives him a letter, walks right back to get to give that letter to other houses on the block. My mm. uncle looks at the letter and drops it on the table. I could read then. It's seven years old. It's a John, you are now employed and drafted to go to fight in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, um, in lieu of Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. On, mm. on route to, to pretty much you drafted to go fight in the war. And he couldn't say no. He was gone the next week. He comes back yep. four years later, Purple Heart. Me and my brother, we got G.I. Joe's. We asked him, we put one of the Purple Hearts on the G.I. Joe's. He's like, yeah, take this shit. You know? So <laughs> I'm, we're not molded by fantasy stories. We come up in real time looking at real things happening. So we remember very, I remember clearly, there ain't no weed in Roosevelt, 30 miles out from Manhattan. All of a sudden, there's cocaine. There's a rejection of the cocaine, but there's nothing comes up for the cats that really want to hang out. So they accept the cocaine, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Then you couldn't find a gun in Roosevelt, Long Island, 1974, 1975. I remember this guy got shot on the main road, and everybody talked in the whole town. Remember, it's only a square mile, but it's also black enclaves up the it's called the black belt hempstead freeport westbury neighboring towns but in roosevelt everybody was like so-and-so got shot on nassau road how do you get a gun mm -hmm. by 1977 bro it was like so-and-so got a gun so-and-so there was a shootout oh this person is now selling cocaine in 1978 people we started to know were getting killed on that same road by an influx of guns and this new drug running rampant called cocaine. 78, mm -hmm. 79 was really the, the, the summer of blood because it was about five people that got shot that summer. Where the guns come from? It's something mm -hmm. when you hear like, there's no guns in 74 to like people got guns and they got this new drug out. What was happening in the city was the cocaine wars. When people start hearing mm -hmm. names like 
Bronze and all that uh, names that they start seeing in movies like uh, what was that movie but uh, uh, with Denzel in it? Um, uh, uh, it was I think mm-hmm. it was. Uh, I have a song in it. I even got a song in the movie. I forgot the name, but they talked about the Frank Lucas drug trafficking, you know, cocaine, mm-hmm. how the cocaine was in flux. The drug game was in flux on the east and the west coast in New York, really three points, Miami, New York, and also Los Angeles. You know what I'm saying? Uh, said through San Jose Mercury News breaking that story. So with this, this was cutting into the momentum of us as young energy, us looking at ourselves, you know, look, 1979, Gamble and Huff put out a song, right? Not only did they, 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 they now Rogers writes a song in 1979 that became the Pittsburgh Pirates theme, We Are Family. At the same time, in that same summer, McFadden and Whitehead working for Guinea Gamble and Leon Huff, Philadelphia International Records, Ain't no stopping us now. Yeah. yeah. Also, at the same summer, King Tim the Third comes out with, with um, you know, here we go with um, Fatback rap, King Tim the Third, and then later mm-hmm. on that fall, Rappers Delight comes out with Sugar Hill Gang. This thing is like this, bro. Right? With all this stuff, real things, real things happening. Co and Tell Pro doing this thing. We, by 1979, black folks was just trying to figure this thing out because it was getting pulled apart, but was coming back together. And hip hop mm-hmm. was as strong as it ever was the year before it became records. But here we are, mm-hmm. 1979, going into 1980. A bunch yeah. of different things happened. Not only is COINTELPRO geared up to uh, for the final part of the 70s, whatever they plan to do, but he going mm-hmm. into the eighties. You have Ronald Wilson Reagan running mm-hmm. for president with his vice president George Bush, and this mm-hmm. was the 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 signature of the eighties will be different, <laughs> and mm-hmm. it sure was to us as a black community. So by the time, bro, make a long story short and a short one shorter. By the time we get to writing songs and making records, which we never had any idea we would make a record because we were DJs. Was it to yeah. me? It was possible to make a hip hop record in the seventy-eight. It was a hip hop record, right? You know, I have no idea. It becomes that thing, and it and by nineteen eighty-seven, eighty-six, eighty-eight, it's a culmination of a thousand or more conversations. I go to. I'm in school at the same time. I meet Bill Stephanie. Bill Stephanie is a person just like me, Hempstead, but but just a. Uh, a, a, a incredible mind, a Bengali, a musician, an athlete, just a, a superman, you know, who we befriend, and he also has the uh, ability to run a radio station. Well, he's the black guy at a college radio station, but he happened to be the guy who happened to be the program director. Everybody went to him because he knew how to make it happen, right? Long story short, like Andre Brown, Dr. Dre, not the Dr. Dre from the West Coast, our yeah. Dr. Dre. They one that started Yo MTV Raps. Yo MTV Raps, yeah. Of a whole bunch of people that said, listen, man, we can't wait for anybody to do anything for us. We got to do for self. We only 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. We already knew that the old heads abandoned us trying to deal with their problems. They abandoned. They just like, they, they moved on to trying to become a part of damn America. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We were like, well, we ain't gonna have no answers for us. We had nothing. We had zero. The only thing we had was this. And we, and, yeah. and every night at the radio station that we had, we would go into six to seven hour conversations every night on what's going on. It goes right back mm-hmm. to your segment. What is yeah. the hell is going on around us in 1981? Now, when I talked about those guns and drugs at the edges of the 70s, by the time it gets in the 80s, it's like, this is everywhere. Crazy. And yes. I remember going to a club, man, One, tr- we were trying to get these acts to come out to Long Island and hire them. And we went to this club, and the club will go unnamed. I remember going in there and saw this 14-year-old kid in the Bronx. And he got a $100 bill and a mound of Coke. <laughs> and, and it was just normal. 
when you start seeing the stories about the South Bronx and, and how it was the battle zone and abandoned, you know, and it was abandoned for a reason. The, car, the Cross Bronx Expressway runs through it, destroys the neighborhood, the people that own the build, buildings at that time. You know, white folks, Jewish folks own the buildings. They moved the hell up out of here, but they still own the buildings. But they still said, man, the we ain't got to take care of them buildings. Look, we ain't got nothing to lose. And then later on, they figured out, look, we have nothing to gain. So if it burns, it burns. Look at the insurance money. I stay in Boca Raton. They left the Bronx for dead. And out of that, or out of those ashes, hip hop arose and was the expression to say, don't push me to the edge. The reason yeah. it started out is all party music because they looked around, bro, and saw Armageddon, devastation. In their minds, they they all they said, listen, I'm going to pretend that this is the best place in the world and this is the place to be and I'm going to party on to the break of dawn because when I mm -hmm. open my eyes, <laughs> it ain't dead. So that's yeah. why when people, start, especially to this day, when they start asking questions like, well, hip hop didn't start out like that. They started off on party records. I said, yeah, because they had to look at partying as hope. Yeah. Later on, Melly Mel broke that but said, all right, I'm going to give you to you the real deal of what I'm looking at. Broken glass everywhere. People pissing yeah. on the like they just don't care. Rats. Are, yo, man, he's brightening it up a little bit. It's worse than that. Yeah. I and remember. That, I remember. We saw that, brother. We saw that metastasize across the USA at a rapid rate. Remember the first day when somebody was, yeah, they did cocaine, they was in the club. We used to run the clubs, bro. All of a sudden, mm. we run to the clubs. We think people partying hard. No, they, there's something that is it, not just, <laughs> they just ain't coked in here. It's something else. They embalming. Oh, it's crack. And crack would keep a person in the, in that spot till 10 in the morning if they could. Never blinking. Yeah. Be like this, bro. And yeah. when they found out how to flip that coke in the crack, it wasn't so much the test areas out of New York where it devastated, devastated, I devastated our hometown. I remember a valedictorian and his girl, who was the the whatever the next person, the valedictorian and the salutatorian. They were in the school. Three years they dated each other. They for, to see them four years later on on the street corners selling mm, this. Yeah. Off. See, I mean, I mean, it was like whoop and. If New York and Long Island was the test area in Jersey and Connecticut, during the beginning of Public Enemy, we saw it metastasize. We saw Detroit have that situation in 85. We saw Atlanta had that situation in 87. They, had, they still had communities in areas that rejected this coming in. But for some reason, it metastasized generation gaps widened communication gaps widened and then of course you're seeing it in oakland 87 88 kansas city 86 this thing just spread st louis you know now you got the the drug game going from la to st louis and denver and the gps of the 1980s r b reagan and bush cointel pro was the infiltration of guns and drugs in our black community we never ever recovered off of that never and you know and i got I, to this it, it it showed what happened and it went at discussion of what happened in the turn in the real time sorry to cut you off no go ahead go ahead Sport coming and we answered it as it was riding alongside us and also being popularized by what people kind of put as an appendage to hip-hop like oh it's just street culture yeah, mm -hmm. no, that is not street because that's drug culture, that's gun culture, yeah. that's cold, yeah. culture. that's government. But, but when you 15 and 16, bro, we were I was 27 to 28. I saw it coming. I'm from New York. I'm going to let people know. And uh, and and my job too, and this is my last point for the next question. My job was to process our whole decade of being together mentally coming out at certain things and how to, how do I process these things and truncate it into words, into a song. 
and how we make it happen into a song and a beat. It's almost impossible, bro. It takes a nation of millions yeah. to hold us back. It's only an hour, bro. Yo, bro, the yeah. show is only 48 minutes. How are you going to take, how are you going to take <laughs> a, defense system, a, a mental defense system and put it in an hour? So you have to figure out like, what's going to work here? What's going to work? What's That's not going to work. This is going to work. And then we got to prove it. And we never did music that was, that was digestible or compatible. We, we, we created noise because we knew that when we step into the room, noise is this. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I could be. Yeah. And that's loud mm -hmm. as a mark, bro. So yeah, it, 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 you give thanks because it's portal through you. And I have to be a good listener because I have to take everybody's point of view. Hank is different for Griff, is different for Bill, different for flavor. Everybody still comes from the same dynamic of knowing what is what, you know what I'm saying? But everybody has a yeah. different way of expressing themselves and not going for the vote. Some might be like, oh man, let's do this tomorrow. Some might be like, yo man, <laughs> fall back a week later. I have to be the person that processes this. And 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 God came through me and uh, through us to have that moment in time, like footprints in the sand, to say something that was also going to be able to chase the COINTELPRO down in words, message, meaning, beats, and culture. Yeah. Yeah. You know, at the end of the 80s, you know, because you all, when y'all was coming in, I remember, you know, that grassroots, that, 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 um, the more of the, um, the pro black, it started to rise up. There, there was this now, you know, the, 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 the conscious community, the people taking a little bit more pride, putting out the Afros again a little bit. Yes, sir. And then it turn because at your time when y'all's album dropped, NWA's drop album dropped, I think that same year. You know, for those who don't know, I used to be a DJ. DJ Wiggy Wig back in the day when I came yeah. back to the state. Shout out to my man, DJ Darren Brown in Savannah, Georgia, because we collabed and did some things. But, um, you know, um, I watched a turn in uh, in the shift in the music because one of the things that you know uh, you you were touching on with the guns, the drugs, and then all of a sudden it was really even also involved in that with the gangs. Right. And right. when all of those came in, it was a, it was it was a, uh, a a mixture of devastation to me because. Right. Where I was so 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 proud to stand tall and have this voice like you and Public Enemy out there, you know, mm -hmm. it seemed like all of a sudden now, start to you know the nineties nineties because you had the uh, uh, fear of a black planet yes, that sir. hit on the nineties, right? right? And that came off hitting strong, mm -hmm. and then it was like this battle now against you know righteous teachings and 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 pro black and all that now you have this you know gangster rap as they were calling it and it was like this this tug of war yeah. in the streets do i be pro black and stand tall and or do i ride out with this you know i'm a nigga for life yeah you know what i mean so, it was a chess match uh, it was, it was a, chess a chess match. Match. when we did what we did in 1987 1988 we knew the other side was coming in in the, in the 90s or early 90s. We knew it was going to come in because what mm -hmm. you create is like you're making a tunnel. And you, you're making a tunnel, meaning that you have the energy going out in the tunnel. But understand, the devil, whatever word or whatever context you want to put it in, is going to use that same tunnel and those same yep. techniques and with the same face. And maybe even yep. conditions yep. that were legit a piece of it. Like gang yeah. culture was a different culture in the seventies before guns. Before <laughs> yeah, guns, I'm quite sure. yeah. Even even in L.A., it was territorial. You couldn't just mm -hmm. go and knock an old lady in the head and, uh, and Watts man in nineteen seventy two and think you get away with. You could get jumped and maybe get tossed and lost, right? Mm -hmm. But new generations come up with a different understanding. They have no what communication or no connect connection between the generations. So what happens when you have a generation and a communication gap? And well, how do you get that gap, bro? You get that gap for the old old G's at that time. You get them caught up. You get them on drugs. You lock them up. They might cancel each other. Once you got guns in it, 
you got somebody who might be an OG and another OG. They getting a little squab. Now they got eliminated. Might eliminate one and not the both of them. Then mm -hmm. all of a sudden, OGs are out of the ball game with young cats coming up, and all you got to do is dangle money. So in the 80s, gang culture that used to be territorial turned into, like, I got quick access in a bad economic situation. We ain't getting mm -hmm. no money anyway. We get money like this doing that. And you know what? Yeah, we got affiliation, but, you know, it's about getting this right now. And as time goes on, it erodes the social order, the pecking order, the OG, the YG order. We knew that was coming in the 90s anyway. How many, mm -hmm. how many can we influence to actually hold their ground and be truthful to themselves? So even we could speak from our Northeast standpoint. And the one thing about Public Enemy and Stetson Sonic, who, by the way, just released their latest album on, on, on um, my label just yesterday, Stetson Sonic, a group that lets everybody know Africa in 1986. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? A-F-R-I-C-A, yeah. right? One of the great groups of all time, our touring buddies, uh, Daddy O's, brother, brother for Life, right? They just released. You know, we used to go around and when we go in the Savannah, Mobile, we're going to like East St. Louis. We we used to go around to all these places who would be like, oh my God, hip hop and rap out in New York. Mm -hmm. Probably New Yorkers at a particular time is that they would be on that New York ish, meaning that mm -hmm. they think territory would make them a, a, a higher Negro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like when a New Yorker walk in the room, it's like, come on, dog, take turn that New York off, you know. So yeah. the, when, when rap music artists came out and kind of like never build or bonded with the places they went to. Oh, yeah, they would bond and build with the girls, no question. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. But they never went in, in public enemy and Stetson Sonic. We come from the 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 area of hip hop that we were ice T wherever we would go, we would bond with the brotherhood first. You know, you bond with the brotherhood first and they'd be like, Oh yeah, my sister's over here. Or my, you know what I'm saying? Whatever that rule of thumb really set us off different. And then we encourage people to do their own rap in their own cities instead of waiting for who's going to pop up out of New York or LA. But that was in that generation. The next generation is going to come up and going to look at it becoming a business. And Quincy Jones said it best. He says, you know, art is art. It's our expression. But once money starts talking, God walks out the room. Mm. Mm. And that's what happened <laughs> in the 90s when they said, oh, oh, rap music and hip hop is a business. Well, it was a business when you did it the right way. And when Russell Simmons and Rick Rubin did it with Def Jam in the 80s, you still had Houdini, you had Heavy D in the boys, you had diversity. But it wasn't looked to be a pop music. LL Cool J, Big Daddy Kane, even when they battled, it was bars and I'm the best rapper, whatever. The 90s came in, all of a sudden it became a business to the point where you would ask people like, do you love hip hop? And you'll find somebody that says, yeah, I love hip hop. Oh, okay, you why you love it? Do you love black people? And mm. once you start getting that, well, what's that got to do with anything? That is the changing of the guard, which means anything mm. goes. Because mm. who's actually talking to the people? It's black music. Even this to this mo moment right now, bro, brother, go black. Right now to this moment, there is a thing going on in, in the USA that is so derogatory to us as a people and culture from everywhere, from us and also uh, uh, around the peripheral, where you can't connect the word black to culture because it's it goes down to people, well, what's that got to do? Wait, what's it yeah. that got to do with it? So mm -hmm. they've turned black into the curse word. It always was. It's mm. the curse now again. You could say yeah. MF, you could say it, it you could say anything. Call somebody, you know, oh, you know, you once you start saying black, then all kinds of excuses pop up like, what's that got to do with it? Oh, mm. and that's this is where we are right now with the defense of the culture. So, yeah, that was coming in the 90s. It became big business. 
And then big business talks, guy walks out the room. That's where we at. Yeah. You know, because those 90s, man, there was a lot also going on in that in that decade because, you know, we had the Rodney King beatings, you know, that hit, you know, worldwide, basically. Right. And then, you know, the white officers got off, you know, there was the riots that happened, you know, and, and all of a sudden, rest in peace, O.J. Simpson, who just passed away, uh, his court case. And, you know, people wanted, you know, redemption. People wanted payback. So, you know, that hit a, hit a scene. And then you had uh, a lot of, of these other things that were transpiring. And I know that you had y'all moved into some of your other albums that took you on to about the mid nineties. Right. And, right. and I know that there, there became a breakup in the group, right? Um, yeah, there was, there, there was, there, was there, there had been entries, exits, entries and exits. Yeah. 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 The whole key is that we've always been right here as family. I mean, even to this point, mm -hmm. there's some people that really serious don't get along with each other. But as you know, in life, that happens, man. That happens even where in your town, it happens in your household, it happens with your family. But yeah. I'm using the guy that, that has been the person that I don't keep a, a closed door policy. I keep a no door policy. I don't even keep an open mm -hmm. door. I don't keep a door, which has been to the death <laughs> But since the words channel through me, I can allow that to happen and take the hit. I tell them yeah. all the time. I'm like, well, if you guys can't see eye to eye or whatever, or whatever, we'll pick up where we left off maybe one day. Yeah. Or just do your best to understand that you're an owner to what you think was slave to what you say about your brother. And we get it. And... Mm -hmm. Like I said, in the 90s, I think the initiative in the 90s and also the 21st century, I made up in my mind in 1992, after being invited to Ghana during Panafest that year. And this is when mm -hmm. um, Lieutenant Colonel Rawlins was was going into uh, his president presidency. The Nation of Islam brought Public Enemy out there to be the theme musically and and it was historical in, in many ways. You know, many groups had gone to Africa, a few groups that went to Africa before us, but they never went into Africa with Africa in mind. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? 1992, where they convened at Panafest from around the continent to come to Ghana for that particular time. And once again, thanks to, to Nation of Islam, Mr. Louis Farrakhan, and also uh, Brother Akbar Muhammad, who to me has been my mentor and GPS to tell you back when I was like 31, 32, 30, he already traveled to at that time, 146 countries. So I used to mm -hmm. soak him at his Ghanaian house, you know, at Cape coast and just soak him for just knowledge of what he's seen and what he's gone through. And at that particular time in the nineties, there was a lot of, I mean, bro, you know, I mean, just there's so much that that is unsaid, unheard, but you see and you feel that it takes a couple of years to see the momentum go in and either make something happen or take away something that looked like it was happening and just erase it like in one day. So yeah. what is, is done is that the, the, the human beings, the human beings who just want to live, who just want to be able to have land, food, shelter, clothing, and to be able to live and, and spread family and, and have something over generation, generations, to see them fall to gov government malfeasance and takeover and the same European crap, and, and still, you know, work on keeping the continent divided, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 54 yeah. puzzle parts, you know what I'm saying? It's something yeah. that you learn to figure out, like, listen, you know what? Humans versus governments. I'm going to be on the human side to figure out how this earth could become earthicens for human beings' sake, because there's enough on this planet. 
but we know that the games are always going to be playing. Sometimes it's hard to even how are you going to explain a game that nobody knows the rules and they, they don't they don't even they don't even have it on their radar. You know that they don't have anything on their radar other than the United States of, of TV. Mm-hmm. <laughs> even mm-hmm. the, it's a United States. They all screen ages, bro. They're looking at mm-hmm. the screen in this generation now with more access to go anywhere on the planet mentally and even some cases physically, but they're locked and chained to what that screen tells them that they are and they're not. So -hmm. therefore, when you have a discussion, and and this is what we're doing in 1991, we connected to all those places in the world. uh, Even when the MP3 came out, it's like, yo, man, we can't get records there. I said, I could get records there because I allowed on the bootleg in Hungary. I allow them to mm. boot re- bootleg in, in, in Zambia. All we mm. got to do is just show up there and it's not in your metrics. It ain't in your algorithm system coming up out of the Western world. There, you know, here's another thing, bro. If I play in front of 50,000 people in Johannesburg and I play in front of 30,000 people in Brazil, and I play in front of 10,000 people in London, how the hell are you gonna count those 10,000 Londoners more than the 50,000 people in Johannesburg? Mm-hmm. How, are you gonna, how are you not gonna consider my 30,000 people I played to in Sao Paulo and not consider it You know, compared to like the 3,000 people I played in Hanover, Germany? Because mm-hmm. those people don't count. It's the same thing when I talk, you know, things that we talked about in the 90s. In the, in the 2000s and all this, uh, uh, finding things to talk about in your topics that make people like, damn, I never, damn, that makes sense. Damn, all right? That's that's our job as a culturalist. For example, yeah. you can't take paper money with a black face and exchange it equally with paper money with a white face. Nowhere in the world. Right? Do you know mm-hmm. where you got that? I got, I got currency. It's a black face on it. Where could you take that, bro? And get an equal white face for it, or white a, a country with a white face. What are they gonna take? So if it's if it's racism in the money, that'll tell you right there. So when somebody comes along, it's like, oh man, Chuck, man, you 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 trying to be a divider of people? I said, bro, man, I could t- name ten things that make you say, damn, wow, y'all way behind, uh huh. Mm-hmm. But you don't mm-hmm. think about it it's on your radar, and mm-hmm. then we. Don't about it because they make sure if it's down their radar, damn sure ain't on my our radar. Our radar yeah. used to be because we wasn't in the circles of media and all this other stuff. We had a two or three year window to use hip hop and rap music as an agent prop against Cointel Pro. Because mm-hmm. where the hell was it? Wasn't gonna see us on night nighttime. You wanna see us? You ain't gonna see us on no major anything unless we getting thrown up in trouble. We in a war zone. We, you know, what I'm saying there's so many black people who are on 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 TV now because when they they decided, oh, this is Haiti week. So because it's Haiti week, you see black faces, right? Oh, yeah. That, yeah. We're gonna talk about barbecue for a week. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. <laughs> this week, oh no, you ain't made the news because this is the week we gotta talk about. You know, you know. So the whole key in a culturalist, bro. Is to understand this is like art. This is like artificial intelligence. There's so many people freaked out and scared of it and running, but you can't run from it. It's mm-hmm. gonna be here and it's gonna it's gonna be it's it's everywhere and it's gonna consume any area around you. Same yeah. thing with isms, sexism, especially racism. You got to figure out how you go about it and have your chest move against that chest move. Because that chess move by the enemy is thought out and is probably helped out by algorithms that, that kind of work against us. But that doesn't mean we were naive and stupid to the fact. Right. It doesn't mean that, that that okay, truth is everything, but truth out of season. You find the season and the reason for it, you deliver it. Mm-hmm. If it comes like this and you got opposition, it's like, okay, now, now we being stupid. If this was a, a basketball game and that's an eight footer that's blocking shots with a with a car, I mean, I'm, we'll figure a way to come up with a plan to get this in there. And I might not be the one that scored a bucket. We got to be happy for one another, and that's another thing that we learn from music. If like that person, and this is where we come from in the eighties, they used to say, "Well, hip hop doesn't have a Grammy." We was like, 
we can give a damn about no damn Grammy, but mm -hmm. we represent a collective of hip hop and rap artists. And by default, I'm like, okay, that guy. So we don't win the Grammy. They're like, oh, Chuck, you didn't win the Grammy. I said, no, but Will, Will Smith and Fresh Prince, they won the Grammy. And we're in the protest to make sure that the category is recognized. Mm -hmm. Because it's about the category, it ain't about the individual. And because he won, we won. But, mm -hmm. but that's all microcosm of how we have to look at life. Oh, a brother over there trying to do the right thing with the right people and stuff like that. We cheer for that if it's the right way, it's positive, and, and it looks like it can metastasize the, the doing good things against the opposition. Because there's always going to be opposition, just like in any gravity or sports event or whatever, it's got it's going to be opposition. We have to cheer each other's forwardness and accomplishments on better. And that's what I think came out of the 60s and the 70s. If we mm -hmm. didn't win, you won. Psh, so I'm going to salute that. Mm -hmm. When you individualize people, then it becomes a little sticky, man. It was like, you know what? They won. It ain't me. Wow. Let me ask you this, Chuck. Let me ask you this because, um, you know, and I don't, mean, was, I don't mean celebrity. I don't mean celebrity. I, yeah. I, I don't mean celebrity. I mean forward movement accomplishment. And you, when we see that, we should feel good about it, even if we don't be like, you know, uh, that don't seem like an organization I would join. I don't. Yeah, I wouldn't have did it that way. But you know what? There's something there. There's something there. I, you know, I think that's a good way to look at things. You know, there's been this drastic change because we about to encounter, you know, go into the 21st century with your music and what was actually how things actually transformed into what we see today. I mean, we saw a, a degradation of our own, uh, whether it's the, the the men against the women and you know the B Collins and the the niggas and all these things right here. How does that sit well with you? Or if it does, how does it sit with you when you see that, you know, in the nineties, it was, you know, you came out, brothers are going to work it out. You had the million man March. You had the, these attempts of trying to bridge, to bridge that gap that was happening. And then the music industry is pushing to widen the gap. And then you see now the guys come in, like you say, it's the money now. It's about the money grab. It's about paying. And the message changes now. And then you see this whole degradation of a community that just even gets further apart. How does that sit with you um, being in that, that, that the music industry like that? And you see this new type of image coming about. I mean, it hurts like a gator in your backyard. Yeah. <laughs> you know where the swamp is and the gator climb the fence. I mean, yeah. however, you got to know, number one, don't put your child in the backyard while the gator running around. You, yeah. you got to be a realist. The cheapest price is to pay attention. Mm. Um, and when you're paying attention, I think uh, you, you live life, love, but also align yourself with like-minded people and don't look down on people that don't think like you, but at the same time, you 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 got to be able to gauge your distance. Yeah, I never liked it. I never. I come from a time where I never liked the N word, and I dressed I am like like the, the N word. So all of a sudden, yeah. saying the N word is a popular thing, right? I'm not gonna mm -hmm. ride with it because oh yeah, it's a popular thing, and I don't. I feel I feel hard against it. No, I'm going. to name i'm gonna say why i don't like it and i'm gonna hold my ground right here now that mm -hmm. don't mean we can't break bread but they're gonna right. understand where i'm coming from i'm like listen you know where i'm coming from because i told you already you know what i'm saying yeah i'm gonna have to if i do shake hands it might be maybe with elbow distance it might be mm -hmm. a quick hug and all that but you also know because i mean we come from basics would say you choose your friends you choose your friends. All right, you don't choose your family, but pretty much you got to choose who's who's your family too. I like the other. Uh, I looked at your um, show the other day. He was like, "Listen, sometimes you got to make your movement by yourself and make your movement and see where it plugs up into." 
Mm -hmm. if you bring a lot of people, a lot of different spices into the soup, when you already took time to plan out, design, architecture it, go about it, go about mm -hmm. it, and say, okay, man, we got, we got, we got eighty percent of the way. Now we find this like-minded situation that might take it twenty percent away, or we use what we all have if we're breathing, the aspect of time. And maybe time will wait it out where we might climb to get that extra 20% to finish and complete the task and the job. I think that old heads and scholarship is being tossed away too easy. And, and I say this, I say this in this way. I think that because we have apparatus and we got access and stuff like that, we can read anything at any time. Mm. We're not scholars. Scholars, no. scholars do scholarship, man. No scholar should be slept on. Even if they got a uh, whole bunch of philosophy that they studied against you, it doesn't mm. mean they take it lightly. Scholars read everything, bro. Dr. John Henry Clark read everything till he was blind, bro. Yeah. They read the good, the bad, and the ugly. And then their job is to sort out and then comprehend it into a concise conversation where they say, I could get into a debate, but then a debate got to lead to what? Something in real life. It could just be like it stayed in a, in a hall and in a, in a classroom. It's like, okay, yeah. what's the practicality out of this conversation, out of this debate? That's where reading and comprehension and then building and community come from. But I think that we've disregarded scholarship. I think we've disregarded what, and they in the past they used to say, "Oh yeah, you just smart. You smart people." I mean, it's beyond that. We all gifted in different areas, maybe, right? But the aspect of a reader who reads, comprehends, and then deals with doers, and able to have it you moved into practicality. Those links are missing in the chain, bro. Mm -hmm. And when you do this, scholars and people that really spend their time up here, you have a society goes down because all of a sudden it's like, like the people that do the ugly detailed work, the next generation says, I don't want to do that because I ain't getting no love. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, mm -hmm. you go to places like Malaysia and Thailand, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah. they mentally... Or taking on in India, they mentally are doing all those ugly areas that we've been also as Coatel Pro too to, to be staved away from that. Go in this area where they jumping and twerking and all that stuff because that's the way that you can make it, and never try to figure out how to get in and build one of these damn machines. Now mm -hmm. that ain't for you, dog. This is what you do. So mm -hmm. when it comes down to like you know, and, and let me tell you. You know, time moves like this. All of a sudden, yes, five years turns to 10, turns to 15, turns to 20. You're like, damn, man, it's 20 years happened already? So where are we? Oh, oh wow. well, the four people I used to build with, like three of them are gone now. They transitioned on. And the ones mm -hmm. that came under, oh, they happen to be, oh, yeah, they, oh, you in Bangkok, man. <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm saying? But the, yeah. the time, the time is, is, is one of the misunderstood and mysterious portals of our existence how to be able to manage our time. You're never going to be able to master time. If you can manage mm -hmm. time, then you could be able to what? Share time. And when you could share time, then you could begin to talk about who does this to what? I looked at the program with Akon City. Fantastic uh, utopian vision. Mm -hmm. Right? Vision, hopes, heart. Spirit, maybe all those things he might have wanted to put into that. But that might have been A, B, C, D, E in a Z program. Yeah, yeah. You have to be able on A to tell all the people that you sweep in how to be able to understand where they fit in that philosophy. This has been a crippling effect for our movement the last hundred years. We could go back and then somebody say, oh, man, look like Marcus Garvey was on his way. And all he needed was 1925 J. Edgar Hoover beginning COINTELPRO to upset that boat. <laughs> and yep. he up, ended up in the ATL federal prison. And then in, in 10 years, had everybody, that little kid throwing rocks at him after he was deported to Jamaica. And then 
instead of that being a story that we look at and saying, listen, what were the advantages and the mistakes? It gets tucked away for 40 years until reggae artists bring up his name. Mm -hmm. So the culture dragged them back out to say, nah, there's something that this brother had here. It took 40 to 50 years. Or maybe something that, that trick, trickled into the um, Malcolm X's parents meeting each other as Garveyites in, in Montreal and saying, mm -hmm. we, you know, this is something here. It's always that energy that we have that gets truncated by forces that don't let and connect the communication of the generations. Mm. However, bro, it doesn't mean that we should be downtrodden. It doesn't mean we lose hope. I remember when people used to say, you know, everybody has their purpose. It's like, it's like fish. You like, you don't eat the bones, you eat what's edible and Removed. Some people might make use of the bones, and like in a lot of places, like in Africa, they'll make use of them damn bones. We ain't get rid of no bones, right? But like <laughs> people say, take what's edible and leave it away. They'll get, oh man, I don't like Jesse. I'm like, you don't know Jesse. You born 20 years after. What brings this conversation up? There's something in. Oh yeah, I don't think you. Maybe he was snitching to the feds. I said, bro, you you in you. In, you in Evansville, Indiana. What do you know about that? What can you take from that? If he says, keep hope alive, then you take from that and figure out how you could be better than he ever was. Everybody yep. is useful. Not everybody should be that, oh, I got the master plan. Toss up your money. and Because that basically, that right there is church. <laughs> it's like, yeah. right? You're like, church, yeah. I'm going to sell, sell you Jesus, man. I'm gonna sell you yeah. God, and and yeah. we fall to that, and I and I don't get into that. So a lot of times I say, mm -hmm. just in the bro, people are like, oh well, what do you Chuck? What do you think, Chuck? I said I believe everything and nothing at the same damn time. <laughs> that, that's my that's my philosophy. Yo, you want to yeah. go there? With that? You think so? I'm with you, dog. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. What do you think, mm -hmm. Chuck? Well, if you break it down to me, I'll give you a calculated answer. I might come back with what I think tomorrow. Oh man, I ain't yeah. got time tomorrow. I said, this ain't no barbershop, bro. I'll I'll out this existence is not the barbershop, man. This existence mm. is 24 hours a day. And if you sleep eight, you got 16 being awake and eight hopefully being asleep. And even that time, your mind behind your eyes and behind your skull is already working. What you're gonna wake up with and what you're gonna do after you wake up is totally on some other thing. So I believe in our, in our our energy as a people is just incredible. We don't have, we've never been able to administrate our energies around the world. I always was saying that if we think that we're going to change the world in this century or even the, in the last parts of the century and think we're going to just stay in the United States and the 2000 by 3000 lower 48 hot box and you're going to change the world from just there? No, yeah, our, my predecessor, our predecessors in the 50s and 60s came up with a momentum that made them activate there and catch the, the guard sleeping as they connected to the rest of the world as being a, a pivot point. But mm -hmm. you know what? Once they figure that out, you got to recognize where's the pivot point now. Oh, it might be in Tanzania, it might be this collective mm -hmm. over here. You got to get your ego up out of the way thinking, oh, yeah, well, the master plan always got to happen right here in, in the Bay Area. The enemy don't work that way, man. The enemy already is moving. So yeah. we have to have movement. And another thing, it's hard for them to shut us down when we move in with beats and music and being happy. We just said move with beats, being happy, and be very smart and make sure you have you, you know your advantages. White folks mm -hmm. gonna cling to us in the young, the young ones. You know, that, that's just the whole just the young ones cling to our whole vibe anyway. Anyway, the systems help to, to, to separate it. Culture is yeah. the thing that brings human beings together for our similarities and knocks aside the difference. A bring the human into this, the human mm -hmm. into the race conversation, whether you want to say it's a construct or not. But systems, governments, they split you up, they categorize you, 
they name you, they list you, they code you. And now we're going into a realm where they invented a world within a world that you got to access through electronics. And now they said, no, not only do we have the world here, we got the world that you might get arrested for dealing in that world wrong. Ain't that something, mm -hmm. right? We'll arrest yeah. you for, we'll arrest you because we already got mortgage on your mind that you paying mental rent to. Yeah. <laughs> look, look, they already yeah. sold every piece of land on the planet Earth, every inch, right? So what so so what are the what are the, the the devious minds say? Well, we ran out of space, we'll make a universe, and we'll make everybody mm. live in that universe and invest in that universe. Now we got an inside outside. We'll put some stuff on, on, on the moon and make them pay for it. And we'll put some stuff in the universe that we created that will continue to grow inside these things that they'll pay for it, and they'll live in that world. Yeah. So I'm not a discouraged. That was a whole that was a uh, whole meta thing. Yes, indeed. The meta, you buy up some property, whatever, yeah. in this 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 you know illusional world because, or wherever because it's not in here is in here yeah this is mm -hmm. right in here the the the, mor the mortgage of your of your mind is what but see that was a whole other conversation and those are the things if you say like well chuck what, what will you speak and the stuff like that like what do i talk about my my thing is rap race reality but technology has been the last 25 years because that has been the world that everybody's in. Notice I'm mm -hmm. not on Facebook. Yeah, I got Facebook pages, Instagram, uh, X, and stuff like that. You know, because I, th I have things that people ask for that, you know, that, you know, family, the companies involved, that people like, oh, I want to get a P hat. Um, I want to get it. And I'm like, and for years, I'm like, uh, I want to get your artwork. And I'm like, uh, you know, get it, download it, steal it, steal it, or something like that. But then, it, you know, you, you have people around, you have family, and people like, yo, we, we, you know, this could be something. And I'm like, well, you make it something. But the reason why <laughs> yeah. I'm on social media, I, I built Bring the Noise as a cultural media app for filmmakers, artists, musicians, and people that like sports. And I closed the door on that. And I'm like, yo, listen, it's, it's kind of exclusive because I tell people, I mean, I, you got to kind of, to me, you got to be over 40 years old to get it. I'm not going to ask mm. you if you're 31 and 29. I'll just like, you know, you could go to TikTok. You go over there. That's what they got those things for. When you come here, you this is what it is. Matter of fact, mm. you, you think it's boring. It might be boring for you, but it will be beneficial for you, which was Public Enemy's music. It was never for kids. It was never mm -hmm. for youth. However, it wasn't harmful once they engaged into Public Enemy. It was almost, mm -hmm. bro, like the Afro-American experience that we had in 1970 and 71. That's all Public Enemy was. Flavor is the world's oldest teenager. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. he, you know, there was something that Flavor here, Griff here, Terminal X said nothing. You know what I'm saying? And then later on, DJ <laughs> Ford, who's from Savannah, you know, he's a world turntablist. The S1W still do their thing. They have their own organization. They they started coming out of the nation, but also they, you know, they're, they're in security systems and stuff like that. These are real people that are real men that have real jobs. Sister Soldier went on to write books. You know, I mean, we never looked at the public enemy thing to be like, okay, yeah, you know, like yeah, one day we're going to hit the pop charts because we're going to do the pop charts because we're going to do it because you wanted us to do it. Now we're going to do it. And if it hit the pop charts, fine, but that's on our terms. And like, yo, mm -hmm. can you do it again? And I'm the type of person, can you do it again? Nah, I ain't going to do it again. Once I do it artistically, I'm not going to revisit that. Mm -hmm. you, know, mm -hmm. you know, people like that, that I consider artists that that uh, like I consider great people, Nile Rogers, Prince, incredible culture givers of music. And I always looked at rap music and hip hop as being, yes, we can have a standard that's high art too, that is for the people, that communicates to the people. And somebody might say, well, yeah, this communicates to the people too. I'm like, yeah, it's not, it's not, not included. It's just a difference between high art and low art. Everybody has art in them. 
Not everybody has yeah. the ability to get art out of them. And not have, everybody has the ability to have art come out of them that's beneficial for the receiver. When I watch mm -hmm. something on, 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 on artistically or I watch a game, it behooves me that like I leave better than how I came in. And that's what we always try to do. You come in, check us out, you'll leave it better than how you first came in. But also the egos out of it, knowing that there are millions of artists out there. There yeah. are millions of songs out there. But also there's millions of people that put on a jersey that want to go and play pickup ball. We know the difference. We know the difference we see in a, you know, LeBron James and somebody who's just, you know, uh, kicking the ball around outside in the yard. So we know the difference. In music and culture, they've hazed and they made it hazy. They made it hazy by, by removing the history. And once you remove history and geography from a people, you got a slave, bro. We are all geography and we are all history. Mm -hmm. We remove. We removed geography from us. We are lost people. And that's the first thing that they did on us. It's like, you know what? Where you at is where you stay at. And where, mm -hmm. you, where you ain't at, it don't matter because that's over there. Or they mm -hmm. somebody, if you hate when the people say, oh, I'm overseas. Over what sea? The seven seas. The seven oceans, bro. Seven, seven yeah. countries. We could get to like five of them, right? Well, you damn man. It's like, well, yo, so I mean, yeah, but I got problems right now where I'm at. You have problems right now where you at because you're only where you at. Yeah. So that's got a last question, for you, brother. Your show, your show to me is my GPS. You make me feel good. You give me a free ticket to ride, man, and you give me a, a ticket to to look at things I could add to my my to my point of view to give even other people advice mm -hmm. to check into the show or check into what I think is happening over there or you want to get in the tech business well maybe if you go over there you know to Singapore there's something going over there don't spit on the ground though though <laughs> 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 and anyway, yeah, that's wrong. I mean, listen, when you it, it, I, this last point before the last question, traveling to all these countries, you know that I, I what I feel about governments, plural. However, mm -hmm. nation Islam and even us, and me growing up says we are the world. However, right. Abide by the law wherever you go in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's just, you got to you abide by the law when you go into the woods, man. Bear infested woods, man. You got to abide by that yeah. law. So yeah. when, let's say that a kid ASAP Rocky was in Sweden, he knocked some people in the head walking around in Sweden and was wondering mm -hmm. why he got locked up. And the next thing, when Trump was the president, wondering if Trump could get him out. And then when they saw Trump get Lil Wayne pardoned, and then when they saw Biden make that trade, mm -hmm. and got Ricky Griner coming over, I said, oh, now y'all looking at real trades. Mm -hmm. Now y'all looking at real power. Saying we got power and we not collective, or we not in the diaspora, don't tell me about power. Yes, we want to fight the power with the tools that we have. And if our tools are here, then we got to do it collectively and figure out what our steps are. And that's a whole nother conversation. But abiding by the yeah. law, I remember one time we play in Jakarta. I play in Jakarta with, with my rock band, Prophets of Rage. And we all have collective songs of Public Enemy, Rage Against the Machine, and Cypress Hill. Mm. Sure enough, somebody walks in. He says... You are to perform the songs. You are not supposed to speak to this 50,000 people out there. Now it's your choice. The choice is yours. You got a whole yeah. bunch of fans that's out there, but are they, they're your fans, but they're also Indonesians under this government. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now we fuck around if you want is the, is the saying, right? Right, right. Now, I will do what I want. Go to Taiwan. They got a Page on the wall. Any contraband in this country penalties death. <laughs> when mm. you come back to the United States, bro, and tell them this, right? 
sometimes people are like, well, that's why I don't go nowhere. So you rather mm. trust in this United States of America to be your Mac Daddy master because it's you think it's protecting you more than going out there and dealing with the world as a free man on your own. You you need to get rewired because what is it, dog? Is this the place to be where you could say this is your Lord and Savior, United States of America? Cool, I can run mm -hmm. if you tell me that, but don't be telling me, yo, Chuck, we need to fight the power, kiss the feds, and all that, and get into that. Or not. <laughs> like, what is it, man? I'm telling yeah. you, the diaspora in the world is your savior on this planet just to be able to comprehend and understand and feel good sitting your ass in front of a TV in East St. Louis. Mm. Tell you gotta go, mm. but go here. Do like like the Commodore's record. Remember that? Zoom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Do, do the line now, Richie. Zoom. Like, yeah. let your mind take you where you gotta go. But know that being free means to be free-minded to know that the whole planet Earth is yours. You just got to be wise. And like we said, you know, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. That's it. Does it come in the microwave? So I'm sorry to be long-winded about that. But oh, man, go uh, ahead, man. I'm going to my man. When you go to places, I'm like, yeah, this brother got it. Because this is our license to live, to know that this, this it's like, you got the Bible, you got the Quran. Okay, what is that extra page? The extra mm -hmm. page is everywhere. Yep. We the book. We the book. So I got this for you. This yes, last sir. question right here, because I know, hey, I appreciate, man, the time you've given so far. Most definitely, man. But what is your outlook on America, our people? in general what, what is your outlook your in look what do you see because i know sometimes i tell people to see the future you look at the youth yes. because the youth if the youth behave and act in certain ways it kind of gives you an indicator of what the tomorrows are going to bring in and i believe we got powerful influential youths out there in america and like you said we got the good and the bad on both sides and it's always going to be a battle but what's your oh, outlook in there, Chuck, uh, for America? You you think the excuse? Number one, how young is young? Mm -hmm. That's the first question. I consider youth under 40 years old. Mm -hmm. When somebody's 21 and say, yo, I'm too young to know, I'm like, well, you got a gadget in your pocket that you told you totally manage and master to a point. And you might say you're young, but you ain't four. So you got to challenge mm -hmm. youth. Because mm -hmm. if, if, if youth doesn't age up and look at getting older as accountability and responsibility where they hold a power to understand, to pick up and also collect, then they're always going to try to play that whole, you know, I'm, a, I'm just a kid role up into 35. BET used to do that. MTV used to extend teenage years at 35 years old. BET, mm -hmm. the Booty and Thug Network, used to make people, you know, yeah, I could, you know, now you got people who feel... That or I'm 41. I'm yes, you are still young in the in the lifeline picture, mm -hmm. but you're not young to somebody 19. And when you when you chop out the pecking order, it's not supposed to be somebody 60, like you or I talking to somebody 18 and 19. They need the 30 year olds to not think that they're their age, but to be able to talk to them. To show them what that next uh that next area of life gonna be. So it's mm -hmm. that, yeah, the 50s tell the 40s, tell the 30s, tell the 20, and it has to work that way in the way we follow society. Once you start having like old heads and young people's lanes in the middle of their thing, it's like having young people in the middle of your your, you know, it's like they where the gaps have to be narrowed. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's one thing. It's like how young is young, you know, when we age up instead of dumbing and aging down we headed off to different places i mean if it's we used to when we used to say back in the day oh man this young jewish kid is a doctor at 12 or something or, or they had their bomb mitts for their man at 12 and a doctor at 22. i'm like damn okay. well, we have that in aspects of society in africa india but you know that over the last 30 
40 years of Americanizing culture, once culture got dominantly Americanized, and then they got, I don't want to say niggerized, but got Negro-tized and mm -hmm. monetized, then that signal from the United States of America, which was so powerful, will end up, and then this was shocking to me, that, that you would go to a, a Kenya or go to a, a Cape Town and, and see, like, you know, somebody, yeah, yo, what's up, nigga? You know, I went one time I was in Johannesburg at a radio station, right? And this is this is a, a case in point. I'm up there talking, and you know, they I've, I've said this before, and, and, and give me five minutes, so I just want to knock this out. Africa, I told people Africa is the future of the world, not just the future of black folk, it's the future of the planet Earth. Mm -hmm. It has long been the refrigerator of the planet Earth, where people have gone to the refrigerator, taking shit out and just closing it, or maybe even leaving it up to, to, to thaw out and make everything go bad in it. Same thing with culture. Johannesburg, the future of rap is Africa because the, the it's 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 a thing that deals with linguistics, language. You have somebody in South Africa, you know, doing the click and they and they rap. I never see more MCs ever than I seen than like in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. Cape Town got more people born out the womb spitting. Yeah, yeah, but mm -hmm. but Johannesburg is a radio station, and I swear we had to be a hundred rappers outside waiting to get in and get on the radio. So some of them, you know, they spitting. The N word and this thing, and I had to just like I told them outside the parking lot. Listen, what you hear from the United States, and this is some years back, this is maybe a decade ago. What you hear from the United States about Nick, where you get that from? Yeah, it was so and so said. I said, then would I if I said each and every one of y'all in my next rhyme said y'all some kafirs, y'all feel the same way? They were like, oh no, no. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I eliminated it home. It, home, it home. Hey, listen. Yeah. Call somebody in, right? Yeah, I right. call them the P word in the United States. Might get you shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Words yeah. matter. So mm -hmm. I, I used to tell people, I said, you know what? The future of this art form is Africa, but the United States and the powers that be, it's just recently happened and musically a re-recognition of like hearing like Afrobeat and and, mm -hmm. and as a soothing, easy role to it that goes with the rhythm of people. But I said rapping and, and hip hop wise, it's been there in all, you know, I've been there in like at least 40 territories strong for years. Matter of fact, we have Planet Earth, Planet Rap, which is on the rap station in the network that people could get or RSTV app, get the rap station app. And it's run by Miko Kapanen and his wife, M. Gelwa Pagini. And they've been doing this show for 15 years, explaining hip hop in every single territory on the planet Earth. Miko's mm. from Finland, M. Gelwa's from South Africa. Then they've always been. And as I've been trying to get this into the United States scope to pay attention to it, it's one of those things like for 15 years, they've been, I mean, I mean they explain it thoroughly. They will tell you a language, break the language down, break the song down, and everybody in the world follows how they do their music for 15 years. It just doesn't hit the radar in the United States because this, that, and the other is not Americanized. Mm -hmm. which got, right. At the end of the day, they got to be rich, they got to be famous, they got to be flaunting, and that's what's going to get noticed to have all these guys maybe say the N-word outside of Johannesburg trying to get a break. So that's mm -hmm. that. Uh, your final point, where does all this go? I remember years I was on years ago I was on Tavis Smiley show, and they asked me. This was like two thousand one. Tavis mm -hmm. asked me the same question. You know, what I told Tavis, bro, by twenty fifty, this might be five countries, bro. Mm -hmm. I was I was in. Listen, man, we did heavy touring in Europe. Asia and all that and beginning of my career, man, we coming out of West Germany, right? In order to get to Berlin, you got on one road on a bus and you get waking up in the middle of the night with, you know, Germans, what East Germans and flashlights and dogs 
Why? Because that's the that's the second world. It's the Eastern Bloc, the Steel Curtain, and to get up into Berlin. Although you got fans on the other side of this wall on East Berlin, you got to play on West Berlin. Do the radio station, and they call on the radio station. They can't come because there's guns and towers and all that ready to shoot anybody that comes close to the wall. Same thing like when I go and go to Seoul in South Korea. F around if you want. And they waiting right over in North Korea line. So, yeah, play around if you want. This is real. Same thing happened so many years going there. And then one year, I was we were touring. Soviet Union fell. Soviet Union was, like, so bloated that they couldn't take care of all the parts. So in 2001, mm-hmm. I said, listen, it's so the infrastructure of so much disunitedness in the United States. This thing might be five countries by 2050. And when I said that, right, people were sending in notes to be, be how could you say that, sending in the BET? I said, listen, I've been enough places to see the similarities. This place mm-hmm. can't take care of itself if it don't collect right. The United States are really like 50 different countries. Divided states. Yeah. The divided states of America. And the two yeah. that people never consider. The average mm. USA or don't even don't 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 even recognize they can't tell you five cities in the northern country, which is Canada, and they can't mm. tell you five cities outside of Cancun or Tijuana in the southern country. So mm. they, they're they're limited to the spot that where they're at, and they only live in the state where they at. The crazy yeah. thing when the pandemic was happening, right? For the first time, people saw in their lives that a state wouldn't let your ass in if they if you didn't have to pay. Florida was like, nope, we having a blockade at the state line. They showed up, did it. That's right. <laughs> showed oh, yeah. up, did. The, the whole thing what happened four years ago is like, you know, out of sight, out of mind. We even forgot that happened. I never mm-hmm. thought in my lifetime that people would, the whole country would stay in the crib in April 2020. Saying mm-hmm. pretty much a martial law statement like, if you if the disease don't get you, we'll get your ass if you leave that house. The hardest mm-hmm. cats I knew were like, well, you know, I ain't got nothing to do anyway, so I'm gonna just be at the crib and all that. What? <laughs> yeah. it's, it's the three card mighty ho- hocus pocus going on. I tell people like, try not to get dazzled by the three card mighty lights where somebody's going around picking your pocket and you mm-hmm. happy because the government gave you a thousand dollar check and stuff like that. You need to listen. Be a little bit, and I'm not saying you can't have your weekend, get your smoke on, and go to sleep for, but you can't go to sleep seven days a week out of this because mm. just like that, they could be like, you know what, this is what it is right now. We don't know if that United States of America, as we see it right now, will be a complete 50 state union by 2030. What does this mean? Mm-hmm. Texas, Texas could be its own country any day. Yeah. All the Southeast could be like, you know what? You know, Arizona, New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas just took New Mexico and be like, yeah, this is what this is. We got new border policies. Right now, the biggest discussion is like, what's up with the border policies? Is this a state issue or a United States issue? And nobody has no answers, bro. Mm. Nobody has yeah. any answers anywhere, bro. Look, what answers are you getting from across the board, across the orders and, and the waters? A bunch of confusion. Yeah, it has never no, been in a confusing state that it is now in the picture of the world that we see it right now. Yes, we could hope, we could pray, we could be. I'm, I'm optimistic, meaning that know who you are and where you're at all times. And that's where I, that's how I feel. I do. I feel that number one, mathematics is real, bro. This is my 64th year. Mathematics says there's 36 years to a hundred. And I know maybe uh, 10 years, they'll come up with some kind of machinery technology that might extend years further. I don't know what kind of quality, mm-hmm. life, whatever, but mathematics says that I have lesser years ahead than I have behind. So I'm not really going to be in this planet the next 50 years. Mm. And even when we say, all right, we're going to present 
a, a, a picture or a design or a legacy for our children, our family, or the world. We have to remove ego out of it and get to what like what we leave that say at least I entered, seen better, left it better than how I found it. Yeah, and that's gonna be debatable for a lot of people. A lot of people are gonna leave worse than how they found it. So the United yeah. States of America or damn America or USAers, they gotta have to figure out the world before they figure out the country. Mm -hmm. Right now, you see that going around the world, people 10 years ago, they were like, oh, man, I'm going to go to Portugal, man, because it's cheaper there. You can't do that no more, man. Everywhere in the world is finding out like, yeah, yeah, you could have got that crib in, in, in Omaha, you know, because you went all the way over there. You paid more than you would have paid in Omaha. And mm -hmm. at the same time, you don't know the language or the culture, and you spoiled how you was coming up thinking it's going to be that way when it's, it's going to be like, you ain't going to have, if you ain't figured it out. And I understand it. When I grew up, I, I don't know how to pull an egg out of a chicken. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I don't know how to milk no cow. I, I understand the process. I seen it happen. I had parents or grandparents that did that. I ain't do that. So I know the next generation is going to look at things that we've done and going to be like, I don't know what they did, but I ain't doing that. I'm going to have to press yeah. a button to be fed and stuff like that. So these are some of the things I think we have to, as much as we don't like what's coming in the future, there's certain things that we have to teach in the middle of that contamination, that survival for our loved ones to come after and hope yeah. that the next 10 years, we're only going to go one day at a time. I, I go mm -hmm. one week, one day at a time. That's why I don't rush to get in the next year. And in mm -hmm. music and culture and stuff, a lot of times they'd be like, you know, like, oh, man, you got this plan for February. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I'm not trying to get to February 2025 right now. I'm trying to enjoy exactly 18, 2024 on this particular day and then gradually move into the next day and be progressive and do something positive and make small notes that adds up to a volume. Those That goes with, and I, in my closing note, that goes with all the creations I do, songs I make, books I do, radio stations, uh, the, the artists I work with to try to make sure that they get the most out of their art, out of their life, and able to say, wow, this is a great thing I'm able to do as opposed to looking down on it like I don't have no chance. I ain't making no money. I ain't sitting as I, I'm, I'm usually that guy that, that makes them see what they have instead of what they don't have. All right. Hey, brother, I, I appreciate you, man. I know, man, uh, your time is limited, but uh, I don't want to hold you hostage for too long. Right, man, my time, my, this is my time, man. I, you know, I, I, I usually don't tell people where I'm at because we're like, where are you at? I'm like, well, I'm, at, I'm where I'm, I'm where I'm at. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> don't get tracking device, but my time is your time and it was a, a pleasure to be able to build with you and 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 i would love a chance if you, you want to invite me on anytime figure out what's going on trust me i and culture and all that i know what what they're doing i know yeah. the i know the the mythology i know the conspiracy hype and th everybody's talking at the same damn time bro everybody's yeah. talking at the same time i usually don't jump on podcasts. I got 78 podcasts waiting for me to get on it. I'm like, mm. I'll jump on the sports podcast because we ain't talking about nothing. Yeah. <laughs> when yeah. it comes down to discourse and stuff like that, somebody's like, oh man, J. Cole and Kendrick Lamar had beef the other day. I'm like, but they ain't talking about nothing. They, they, they in a business where they're trying to, those are two gifted, smart individuals mm -hmm. they don't have beef smart people don't have beef smart mm -hmm. people they have debates but debates aren't interesting enough for you so you want them to have beef like what the comedians are doing so therefore they put a little bump on kendrick lamar j cole said this and i said yeah because they're smart people they already got careers that's mapped out but to get you to pay attention to them 
You were so American trained like a Pavlovian dog to see brothers in conflict in order for you to be like, oh, oh I'm going to pay attention because I ain't really paying my money. I got them on Spotify. It was like, yeah. people don't pay yeah. for albums anymore, bro. They yeah. they subscribe to platforms. Mm-hmm. That's why I put my own apps and my own, my own platforms and stuff like that. They subscribe. Yeah, I got stuff on all those things too, but in Kendrick Lamar's case, in J. Cole, I just say, yo, keep making music that reaches and don't wait for somebody to approve you. It's like I tell people all the time. If you went to the mirror and you saw how you look, how the hell are you going to ask somebody how you look? <laughs> Since yeah. is that thing. Yeah. You know yeah. how you look. Do your thing. It's so many topics that could be said in rap music and hip hop. Talk about great people. Talk about a great place. Talk about, you know, things like, all right, you got to a certain age. You know, oh man, I hope I don't get prostate cancer. You know what I'm saying? 98% of the topics that are used in the music or cycles topics because they got somebody that says, in order to keep your contract, you got to keep cycling those same topics. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Chuck, so many, so many things. You, bro. Thank you, sir. Thank you, so. And uh, I appreciate you. to catch you. And like I said, just your man, not your boy. And every time <laughs> I'm a fan of gold, black, to Africa, my oldest daughter who runs my um, companies. She's like, oh, you gotta go uh, uh, do the interview with Go Black, Go Black, <laughs> you Africa. Cause she, we, me and her was watching the other night with the with the Akon thing, you know. So uh, yeah, hope the okay. best for him, man. But he's like you say, he's 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 gonna have to go out there dance, twerk, do the Michael Jackson or something. Yeah, <laughs> he gonna do that. something. Something. Something's gotta happen. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. He got to, to come up with a pecking order. Like, I better take yeah. care of this brother first. And then this one. <laughs> That's how you do it. It's like, yo, yeah. you write something that your tail can't cast, and then, then you got to come up with a pecking order real soon. I got to get this one, two, three out of the way. I know I got 30 people I owe, but let me get the one through five out of the way. <laughs> mm. Yeah, the, yeah. You see, this is why, this is why young, young, Young brothers, YGs, I don't care if they're up to 50 years old. You always need older heads to just even out. Like my dad, he passed in uh, 2016, right? Like I said, I'm a Marine, but he, he didn't raise us as a Marine and all. He's just raised, it's just like, yo, man, he was, he's a, a king, right? And sure enough, man, when I get twisted, I go, go to him with this question right and he'll be like well what do you think boom 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 and, and like in a matter of like 60 seconds i'll be untwisted and i'll be like you a warlock you gotta be a warlock <laughs> <laughs> but warlock. i needed i needed I, I i i had him for 55 years of my life and, and trust me bro i'm only like i'm only half the man he was bro and i'm still working on it Wow. Wow. Well, brother, appreciate you, man, coming in, man, sharing. And um, most definitely, I, I'll hit you up every now and then, see how you're doing out there. Yes, Family, sir. please, please, please uh, check out, man, what uh, Chuck D is doing out here. I got to scroll across the bottom, um, doing great things. Um, hey, man, um, you know, I'm going to end of how you said has always stuck with me, man. And also salute your wife for great work and also keeping that, that, that the creative, the business and always looking out. And yeah. Having back in business and turmoil. Cause we, you know, sometimes us males is it, 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 sometimes, you know, we, we have testosterone. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. <laughs> testosterone Chuck. Be toxic. Yes, sir. God bless your soul and keep living. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we just thank each and every one of you all for coming in. We thank our our special guest, Chuck D, public enemy, number one, for coming in. And until next time, 
Peace and blessings. We out. All right.